Hey everyone, welcome in to another daily editorial here on the KE Report. In this daily editorial, we're going to be focusing a bit more on the silver market broadly, especially from kind of a producer front and the investment side of this whole equation and this whole market. Chatting with Chris Ritchie, president of Silvercrest Metals. Silvercrest is traded on the TSX under the symbol SIL and on the NYSE under the symbol SILV. Now, Chris, look, we can talk all we want about the high margin producer that Silvercrest is at the Las Chispas mine. But before we get into some of that, let's talk about the overall silver sector now with silver running higher. Silver's back to over $31 an ounce. One knock against a lot of silver companies recently and over the last few years is that there were no margins in the sector. Companies were producing at a loss over and over almost every quarter. Silvercrest is a different story because you have had operating margins. The fact of the matter is, with metals prices higher, though, we should see margins further expand and potentially some of these losing companies even generate some profit. That's still to be seen in Q2. Chris, how should investors look at Q2 forward projecting what could come out of the sector in terms of earnings? Yeah, and I think that's the right thing to focus on, Corey. You know, when we were finishing construction, we missed the inflation, but our stock was going down because the metal price wasn't doing so well, but costs were going up. So our margins were going in the wrong direction. And what we've seen in Q2 versus Q1 is that the metals price prices for gold and silver are up sort of in the neighborhood of 20% quarter over quarter. So I think there's a very real possibility that this could be a pivotal quarter for the space on actually seeing margin expansion. And if you're ever going to get, you know, marginal investors come in, you know, generalists and see the fun flow really turn on is you have to see these turning points. So with Q3 off to a good start, if you start to see prices in Q3 move up a little bit or even stay static, that dynamic of margin expansion quarter over quarter could continue. So I think, again, like, you know, we've seen inflation really uh, hit everybody in a pretty bad way, but the prices of the metal have finally accelerated and at least for the, the short to medium term have outpaced inflation very significantly. So hopefully this is a big wake up this call and hopefully this is the early innings. Well, Chris, when you're out and about, you're on a lot of podcasts and you talk to a lot of fund managers. Do you have a sense of the generalist, what you're hearing from those fund managers about the mining industry? Because it would seem that with Q2 price levels being a lot higher and Q3 looking like it's setting up that way, that this should be getting the attention of more analysts, more generalists. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is something we are very fortunate to work on is that our high margins allow us to hold on to our metal. Our, they, they allow us to give more exposure to metal to our investors. We have taken a very conscious effort to speak about why our product matters. You know, I spent some time with the CEO of Ipsos Reed, who talked about global polling and almost the number one issue for every major com- uh, country around the world is inflation. And our industry, for the most part, talks about mining, whereas we want to talk about why should you care about the product? What's the functionality of the product? So with that narrative, we can talk to that generalist, people that aren't experts on mining, that a lot of it goes over their head or they simply don't care. We think it's such a tremendous opportunity and we are opening doors. We have a lot more retail people connecting with us, a lot more generalist funds connecting with us because let's be frank, the, the mining industry does not have a fantastic track record of returning positive earnings. So, you know, we talk about that definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and expecting a different result. We're taking our advantages of our operating margins and using that to give our investors more exposure to the metal versus selling the, all of the metal and thinking that we can go build new mines, you know, in a highly profitable manner. So I think, You know, for us, that generalist is out there. I think the momentum from Q1 to Q2 and potentially Q2 to Q3 wakes up all the quant funds and the generalists. And we think we're in a very strong position to capture the imagination and the fund flow uh, from that audience. So we we think our shift from IR to marketing, which is a big shift, is going to put us in a great position. 
So, Chris, th this is a great corporate strategy for a company that can generate profits and doesn't have any debt. But the fact of the matter is a lot of other companies, again, have struggle struggled to generate a huge operating margins. They're also dealing with debt repayments. Is that why we haven't seen other companies or even some of the majors do this and actually hold metal rather than immediately turning around and uh, converting it into cash? Yeah, when we started to do this work about how to allocate our capital, when we started to do the work, we did a very basic calculation. And it was, what is the total cost to produce our ounce? So we added every single penny from day one, the cost to buy the property, all the exploration, the cost to build the plant. And then we included inflation over our life of mine. And we took all those costs and just divided it by the amount of ounces we have. And we were roughly 25 bucks. And at the time, silver was 20. So, you know, for us, the fact that we'd already paid off all of our debt, the cash balance was growing, we had choice. The flexibility that, the, that our asset, the quality asset that we have gave us was we didn't have to sell it all. And for most people, they're paying off debt. They don't have the same margins. That's a big problem. So that's step one. Step two is, well, fine, even if you do make a good return today, what's the cost to build a brand new project from scratch 15, 20 years from now? So that would be taking our $25. And remember that we built our project in half the timeline as uh, our peer group. Not every asset makes it. So there's still a lot of money spent on assets that go nowhere. If we were to put 8% inflation a year on that $25 and compounded that for 15 years, you know, what's the cost to replace an ounce 15 years from now? Same dynamic exists for copper, uranium, nickel, anything else. So I couldn't be more bullish on hard assets and commodities because the ability to replace what we're selling today off in the future doesn't make any sense. So why wouldn't I be holding as much of the metal as I can at this point? Well, Chris, just to that point, a lot of people when we bring up Silvercrest, we'll say, why don't they go take over some companies uh, in Mexico or take over some other peers? And to your point about holding the metal versus making an acquisition, you know, it's a lot different forecast for where the metals prices could go holding us on your balance sheet versus trying to acquire another company. So maybe talk about growth that you could do internally, organically, because you already have all the sunk cost in place to expand your own property. Yeah, quite often there's not enough of a differentiation between assets that are up and running and things are working versus assets that are still you know, doing their best to get going. So again, there's a big apples to oranges comparison in terms of producers versus developers. So I think that's definitely worth noting. We do like the opportunity of potentially merging or buying or even selling to other producing assets because we do think they're in a different category and scaling would be good. So that's definitely on the radar for us. When we think about that, we want to find a way to give more exposure to metal for our investors while minimizing the amount of risk. So if someone said you could go merge with a producing asset or you could go buy this brand new property from scratch and, and see if you can get it up and running 10, 15 years from now, that's possible, but it's a lot of risk. Right. And I think, you know, people look at Eric and his fantastic track record. And, you know, if there's anyone we're going to give money to go find that, it's him or Pierre for building our asset on time on a budget with Cliff. That's amazing as well. But remember, we're in a different world today. Costs are higher. ESG risks are higher. Taxes are higher. Government risks are higher. So, again, the new supply out into the future is most likely going to cost way more than today's supply. So, Again, you know, we want to give that growth, you know, a lot of thought and we are, but we do want to do that with the idea of minimizing risk. And so while we're looking, right, holding on to the metal is step one, right? We'll hold on to as much metal as we can while we're looking. What Tie this into mine operations then, because you had a new contract miner that came in at the beginning of this year. The mine seems to be running just fine as in Q1, you had 59% operating margin. Again, that seems quarter after quarter. How is that mine running? Because that is still the cash cow that you have. Yeah, I mean, we've had six operating quarters now since commercial production, and we've been averaging roughly 60% operating margins all the way along. So again, that's extremely unique. Again, we've talked about this on previous podcasts with you guys that 
when you look at inflation, inflation tracks the gold price really well, which is why gold is an amazing product we all need. It protects you from inflation. But what it means is that your costs go up lockstep with gold. So my point is that if you've got 10% margins or 60% margins, um, over time, if costs move with the gold price, that means your margins are kind of fixed. Now, we do know quarter over quarter things change. But my point is, is that if we've got 60% operating margins and costs and gold tend to move together, we think we have a permanent advantage, right? So again, it's a big differentiator for us. As it relates to the contract miner, uh, as we've publicly released, we're going to change out the existing contractor. We've already brought in a new contractor. Right now, they're both at site. If we can spend more money to have you know, to do more work than we can to take more tons out of the ground, put them on the stockpile, allow us to have more flexibility to take what's on the stockpile to put into the plant. That's a tremendous amount of de-risking. I want to spend more money today versus more money next year, because guess what? I'm anticipating costs are going up next year. So the more we can spend today, I think it's a cost saving exercise as well as risk mitigation. And at the same time, Again, it really takes a lot of pressure off us on the plan. So right now, both of the contractors on site, they're working well together, and we're contemplating keeping them around longer, see if we can have both of them on site for even longer. So that's something we're, we're discussing because why wouldn't we accelerate that work if we can? So yeah, everything's humming along nicely there. And yeah, hopefully we can get even more tons onto the stockpile and reduce the risk even further. Well, Chris, you've talked a lot about the margin and the importance of that and being able to operate at a margin because you paid off your debt, you've got all the sunk costs. Could you speak a little bit to the expiration upside and not just growing for the sake of growth, but growing marginal balances when you make a discovery on your property? Yeah. And I know that's a big knock on us because I mean, a year ago we put out our technical report and our costs went up and some of the ounces we were going to mine were below economic cutoff. So we lost some ounces and every company has that. If, if the costs have gone up more than the, than the margins, then you, you lose access to some of those ounces. So, you know, that's been the knock on us. And it's a fair knock from, from data that's been old. So for our ability to now say, guess what? We have, we have an exploration budget. We have an exploration team. We're able to hopefully find more ounces at site. We're looking around regionally for ounces that could potentially be put on a truck and uh, driven to our existing plant and really leverage that existing infrastructure that we've built. I mean, that's definitely one way we're looking to grow. But again, you make a good point, Shad, that, you know, growing for the sake of growing is far different than economically growing. So the one way that we point people or one thing we point people to is look at the balance sheet. Is the balance sheet going in the right direction? Are the new ounces you find adding value or are you just trading dollars? And remember, everybody who's paying attention, if your, your ASIC is out there, when you think about exploration budget and the like, that's not included in your ASIC. So if people aren't making, and neither are taxes. So if you're not making much margin on your ASIC, and then you've got more costs for exploration, more costs for taxes, quite often there's people out there that just aren't making any money. So again, I bring people back to the fact that, yes, we're working on it. Yes, we have a team that can do it. Yes, our property has a lot of potential. It does take time, but I would say there's a big difference between adding ounces versus adding profitable ounces, right? You can have a 500 million ounces of reserves, but if there's no margin on those reserves, then what's the actual value of those ounces? All ounces are not created equally. Oh, well, we've seen that in the sector. And I think that's why we have so many companies with ounces in the ground that aren't really getting valued at anything. A lot of them don't make money. But give us more insights in the exploration that's ongoing then. Where are you exploring? What are some of the regional opportunities? More details, please. Sure. So when everything we've been doing up until now has been to make sure we have enough clarity and detail for the mine plan right in front of us right? In the next 12 to 24 months. So we're sitting here knowing that, you know, we are very clear on putting the work into getting the production profile nailed down because we do think we get rewarded or punished based on our quarter over quarter efforts. So that takes time. 
you know, I wish this was a computer simulation. We could just press a button and fast forward, but that's not the way it works. So right now we have numerous veins and targets on site that have not been drilled. And our team is aggressively going back and saying, all right, what are our key targets? You know, where can we put these rigs? Where are we going to be adding resources and reserves, especially with $30 silver? Are there new areas that can expand it for us? What's that depth? Because again, these are targets and areas we, it did not make sense to do earlier. Because if you're not going to get to something for 10 years, you know, you don't want to spend the, the money on something like that today. So again, we're mapping all these targets out, we're putting them in a priority, and we're spending that money responsibly, right? So that's the on site prioritization right now. And then regionally, let's not forget that Santa Elena, which is 25 kilometers away, was discovered by Eric, our CEO. And this is the second asset, Lost Chispas, that he's discovered in the area. Close to 25% of all mining in Mexico is in Sonora, where we're located. So this is a prolific region. And our CEO knows the region extremely well. So to apply what we know to other assets regionally is something where we have a team for, we have a budget for. The social programs we've done have created strong relationships, so people want us in their communities. So we've been going out looking at these regional assets and deciding, okay, which ones do we want to try to advance, make deals on? Because again, the leverage here is we don't need to build a new plant, right? So if we can find enough ounces that justify us taking them out of the ground and putting them on a truck, that's far different than having to find enough ounces building a plant and then processing it. So again, this is work we're doing. It's like the second phase of work on the exploration side. And again, as much as people that might not think of it this way, holding on to ounces is a form of growth, right? We're holding on to as much as we can. And then at the same time, you're seeing this with BHP and Anglo, you're seeing this in you know tech and Glencore and all these other companies are saying, I think it's cheaper to buy assets than it is to build. So we look at us being either vulnerable to doing that or potentially in a position to to look at M&A as something to spend some time on. So we're busy on the growth side. We certainly acknowledge people wishing we'd move a little faster on that side. But again, we're trying to responsibly spend our capital. And, and when I say our capital, I mean, I include all the investors in that comment. Well, Chris, when you think about the regional areas you're looking at or even M&A in Mexico, we get a lot of questions still about how are things post-election? What's the lay of the land in Mexico? Would you want to stick in Mexico or look at other jurisdictions? Could you maybe speak to that and just how Silvercrest is insulated in a way and that you're an underground mining scenario, not an open pit scenario? Yeah, and for anyone who hasn't paid attention, Mexico had an election recently. The new president coming in October is in the same party as the outgoing president. There will be a Congress meeting in September where there's the potential for them to maybe put some final bills passed before the changing of the guard. Um, And one of those reforms is them talking about not wanting open pit mines operating or being permitted in Mexico. So that's a risk. And I think until you get clarity from not only Mexico, but all governments in terms of their support, you're going to get less capital being spent on growth, right? Which is wildly bullish for the metal price because we've already seen this very long standing strike essentially on giving new capital for mining. And as we know, it takes a very long time once you start spending money to get new supply and we haven't seen the new spending start. So I think these issues in Mexico and other countries just slow down more spending. And Mexico is the number one country in terms of production of silver. So if that means, you know, fewer dollars come into Mexico for the short term or medium term, it just makes the metal price that much more interesting. But I would say to your point, Shad, uh, we are permitted, we are operating, we are an underground mine. So we do think we're in a far different category than an unpermitted open pit asset that, you know, that is kind of waiting to see what happens with, you know, some of the rhetoric in Mexico. So, you know, we're quite happy of where we're at, but we do acknowledge that not just in Mexico and other places, we're still not supporting mining. 